imagine that people will walk in and walk out. This is a rather long morning, so, um, but we have an excellent program today that is jointly sponsored by three centers. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just too long a name, it really is. <laughs> okay, uh, the topic, as you all know, is displacements in Eurasia in time of crisis, and we're fortunate to have three top speakers bringing to us different views on, on this question, uh, one from Mongolia, one from, that is, a view from Mongolia, a view from Ukraine, and a view from Kyrgyzstan. So, our, we have three distinguished speakers, from uh, all of the guests with us today. And each center director is going to be introducing the speaker. We're going in this order. I believe first we have Dr. Moore. China and the Mongol Empire and teaches broadly across those areas. His official position, I have to read this out every time I announce him because he, it's, it's a bunch of different um, activities, senior research scholar and adjunct professor of Inter-Asian history and distinguished professor of history at Queens College, City University of New York. And Columbia as well. I forgot that, sorry. Um, he's the author of 20, some 25 books and more articles than I could uh, list in, in a short amount of time. Uh, and they range from uh, imperial period history, like I said, the Mongols going forth, uh, clear down to very contemporary issues in, in contemporary Mongolia. My own acquaintance with Professor Rosabi's work came in my very first year of graduate school, in, in my PhD work in 1992, when somebody suggested to me that I read uh, an edited volume, he edited this volume called China Among Equals. And I'm gonna underline the word among because it was really eye-opening uh, to be in a PhD program that really heavily focused on Imperial China. And if you know anything about Imperial China, the discourse is always that China is the center and everybody else is peripheral at best. And so this book, uh, either displacing China or maybe recentering China as just one of a number of actors, was hugely important to me. Um, and it's still the articles in that book are still um, some of the best there are. Uh, for example, Tom Olson's essay on the Uyghurs of Turfan. Um, but I digress. More recently. Um, he's been working on an oral history of contemporary Mongolia with his wife, Mary, uh, and they've, uh, it's led to the publication of two volumes, at least, and there may be more in the, in the offing, Socialist Devotees and Dissenters, A Herder, A Trader, and A Lawyer, and then another volume, The Practice of Buddhism in Karkaran and Its Revival. Uh, in addition to this, Professor Rosabi has been active in the art world, uh, helping to organize exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. And he's also been on the advisory board of the Project on Central Eurasia and chair of the Arts and Culture Committee of the Soros Foundation. Uh, and finally, in 2008, he received an honorary doctorate from the National University of Mongolia. So, without further ado, I'll welcome Professor Rosabi to the floor. Thanks very much. Um, I've only read 
of the other papers, but I, I think uh, I, um, instead of focusing uh, to start off on the environmental and political disasters we'll be talking about uh, over the next uh, hour and a half or two hours, uh, I wanted to uh, bring up a more optimistic element. Uh, when we talk about Central Asia and Mongolia, we also have, uh, of course, uh, problems around the world in terms of environmental issues. And uh, it happens that a friend of mine uh, died yesterday, uh, Henry Stern, uh, who was commissioner of parks uh, in New York City. Fortunately, he died. He was in terrible pain. Um, and he, uh, during his tenure, 10 years as Commissioner of Parks, he created more parks in New York City than any time in American and uh, in New York City history. So his legacy is, is wonderful. I think one person uh, can make a tremendous difference, it seemed to me, in environmental and, and political. Uh, developments, and I hope there'll be people like that in, in Mongolia and other places in, in Central Asia. I want to uh, applaud him as one of the great heroes in New York City history. But uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is less optimistic. And, uh, there have been heroes in Mongolia, heroes and heroines in Mongolia that have tried to prevent the chaotic uh, disasters that have occurred in the 20th and 21st centuries in Mongolia in terms of environment and, and politics, and I'll mention some of them. But the story is not great in terms of displacements in, in Mongolia. It seems to me that what has happened since, particularly since 1990, in uh, the Mongol pastoral economy is, is a case of a manufactured and needless crisis that has led to the displacement of the population. Um, at the moment, about half of the population resides in the city, in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. A disastrous uh, kind of situation, 1.5 million for a capital city that was designed for less than a million, uh, probably uh, much less than a million. Um, and uh, the results are, are, as I'll try to point out, have been catastrophic in terms of poverty, in terms of slums in Mongolia, the so-called Garrett quarters, where uh, half the population now lives. And it, it, it was a needless uh, kind of policy that led to this. A government, a, a specific governmental policy aided and abetted by foreign advisors uh, since 1990. Since the 12th century, I'm going to read part of this because it, it, it's so uh, indicative of what has happened. Since the 12th century, the Mongols had survived as a mostly nomadic pastoral people. There was a certain amount of agriculture, a certain amount of hunting and fishing, but pastoralism identified uh, the Mongols in traditional times. At various times, there were crises uh, in, in the pastoral economy. Winters are devastating. Uh, in Mongolia, as we all know. And the most dreadful times are the dreaded zuds. That is, when you have a bad winter with considerable ice and snow that leads to the deaths of numerous animals. And even today, it still is a problem. From 1999 to 2001, there were three zuds in a row, three terrible winters in a row. And the animal population, the animal census went from 24 million to about 16 million at the end of these three, three winters. Really devastating to the uh, pastoral economy. And that, in part, explains some of the uh, displacement. The landscape, harsh climate, pose tremendous difficulties. Uh, and what has kept the economy, uh, pastoral economy going, is cooperation. You've got to have cooperation in order to maintain this difficult, to maintain pastoralism in this difficult environment. A uh, good system of administration of the pastoral economy it has to be regulated. Uh, it cannot be uh, sort of everybody on their own having as many animals as they want and uh, uh, not being helped by 
the government in a variety of ways that I'll talk about. Uh, in traditional times, the uh, various khans and the monasteries from the 17th century on regulated the hurting economy in, uh, in, in terms of where migration could take place during, during the winter and during the summer. And uh, that kind of regulation ensured that the carrying capacity of the pasture land was considered. Uh, so things worked out pretty well in traditional times up until the uh, early 20th century. Too many animals, which is the situation right now, uh, there are over 60 million animals in, in uh, Mongolia at the moment. And, and what it's leading to is tremendous desertification, along with the climate change that we're all uh, aware of. Um, when the Qing Dynasty occupied Mongolia, uh, in the last decade of the 17th century, its officials, along with the Khans, determined, the limit, the, uh, determined to limit the areas where herders could migrate. Uh, that was partly political. If, if, my, if uh, herders are wandering around uh, from place to place without any sort of knowledge of the, uh, of the government, it's much harder to regulate them. And the Qing Dynasty, as a Chinese dynasty, was eager to prevent, uh, or a dynasty in China was eager to limit the migrations of, of herds. 1921, uh, the so-called Mongol Communist Revolution occurs, uh, abetted by the Soviet Union. In fact, it was not a communist revolution. The people uh, who led the revolution on the Mongol side knew almost nothing about Marxism knew almost nothing about uh, communism. It was only later that they, were, uh, that they began to uh, focus on uh, Marxism and communism. Most of them were patriots, Mongolian patriots and nationalists who, uh, were, uh, who found the Soviet Union a convenient figure to uh, prevent China from again asserting its control over, over, over the Mongols. And in fact, from the period from 1921 to 28, uh, there was very little change in the uh, Mongol pastoral economy. Uh, private herding uh, of, of uh, the animals and uh, no attempt at collectivization. In 28, uh, there was an effort to uh, move towards collectivization, collectivizing the animals and turning the, her the herders into semi-proletarians. So they would get a wage from the state or from the uh, collective uh, instead of dependence on their own uh, animals. It was a disaster. Uh, the, the effort was made from 1928 to 1932 in imitation of what was going on in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, it turned out uh, that eventually in 32, they had to abandon that effort. There was so much resistance from the monasteries and uh, from the herders that uh, they eventually would uh, withdrew their efforts to collectivize the herds. The, the herders had no idea what it was all about. Uh, there was no kind of education or propaganda about collectives, and they simply thought that their animals were being taken over by, uh, by the collectives. That went on until the 1950s. In the 1950s, uh, the government started an education program and a propaganda effort to convince the herders that it made sense to join collectives. They founded a collective uh, institution known as the Negdes, which uh, kind of cooperatives and uh, explained the, the importance of these cooperatives, that the government would play a role in protecting the herders, that there'd be uh, cultural, educational, and medical uh, help uh, provided by the by the commune by the collectives which had not existed in uh, before the 1950s, and so uh, this time there was very little resistance. There were also loans given to individual herders, which had not uh, been the case in, from 28 to 32, and so by 1960, about 85 percent of the country's livestock was uh, collectivized uh, and. Amazingly enough, uh, 
an American researcher. Uh, I don't know quite how he got in in the 1970s, a man named Daniel Rosenberg. Uh, how he got in at the time when uh, it was almost impossible for Americans to get to Mongolia. There were two, a few tourists uh, from the late 70s on and maybe one or two uh, conferences. And in, in every case, we were uh, supervised by Jochen, the uh, Mongolian travel agency. Uh, I remember in 76, uh, I went uh, for a conference and we really were told not to go out on our own, particularly at night, in part because uh, we would be confused, we would be thought of as Russians, and uh, Mongolians were not too keen on Russia at that point. Uh, a lot of attacks on, on Russians by alcoholic Mongols uh, at, at, at that time, despite the fact that Mongolia and, and the Soviet Union were very close at that time. But we were told not to leave the hotel, <coughs> hotel at that point. Uh, but in, in any case, the uh, Rosenberg got in and he went to one of the most important collectives of that time period, lived there for a year, uh, and produced a fac fascinating dissertation, which was never published at the University of Minnesota, and uh, provides a first-hand account of uh, the, the collectives during that period. He points out that they were authoritarian, there's no question about it. The commune director was extraordinarily powerful, but he points also to the advantages uh, of this uh, collective system. The uh, herders had trucks, or the, the, actually the collectives had trucks to facilitate the movement and dispatch of the animals and animal products to market. The government uh, provided training for herders and uh, published a book by somebody who became actually the uh, president of uh, Mongolia in the late 60s and early 70s, who was a specialist on herding. Uh, my wife has translated that herding um, book and uh, his autobiography as well. Uh, his autobiography is already out, but we haven't found a publisher yet for a herding kind of uh, a guide to herding. Eventually we hope to find one. But in any case, uh, they had that. They had the government, according to Rosenberg, built and maintained wells, uh, supported the construction of animal shel shelters in winter when the animals needed such protection from the zoos that uh, were often uh, afflicted Mongolia. They supplied hay and other kinds of forage uh, to get the animals through the winter. And Basically, the state and the Negdels uh, organized the distribution, the marketing and distribution, the, the, the marketing and distribution of the meat, wool, and other animal products produced by herders. They cooperated in assigning water and pasture land to the herders, and the government sent students to the U.S. SR to train uh, as veterinarians. And so we had there were veterinarians available at almost no cost to, to the uh, collectors. Um, they turned the herders into wage earners. That was quite dramatic. Uh, people had wages rather than any sort of uh, dependence on what uh, happened in the herding economy. Some of this was worked out fine. Some of this led to laziness on the part of herders who <coughs> guaranteed uh, an income. And, uh, Rosenberg points to both uh, the, the benefits of, uh, of a regular wage, a regular salary, if you will, uh, and uh, the downside that you have some herders who, who did not maintain their animals, did not work as hard uh, to do so. Uh, the state, obviously, the most important thing was to get profits from the herding economy to promote industrialization. And that uh, began to uh, happen. There was a, a, an attempt to foster mechanization in the pastoral economy, as well as the start of certain industries, uh, wool industries, and then uh, eventually in the 1980s, cashmere. Uh, helped by the Japanese, they set up cashmere processing plants, and uh, 
Mongolia uh, provides about 20% of the total cashmere in the world. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just, uh, just a little while. They also, since the country had a tiny population, the government adopted a pro-natal policy starting around 1964. Uh, and in at, at 64, as part of the Sino-Soviet dispute, uh, there had been Chinese laborers in Mongolia building, uh, involved in infrastructure projects, involved in mechanization and so on. They were all expelled in 64 as Mongolia sided uh, with the Soviet Union. Um, so the pre improvement uh, pro-natal policy was essential. Uh, any woman who gave birth to uh, four or more children could retire at the age of 45 and be guaranteed of uh, a salary or wage or whatever. Um, the, uh, perhaps as important in terms of the Magdals was access to medicine and so social welfare uh, efforts. Um, small towns in the countryside, in the rural areas, would have clinics or hospitals which provided basic medical care. It wasn't fancy. They didn't have the fancy medical technology that uh, we're used to in, in the Western world, but they were basic. And uh, if a uh, illness or disease was serious, they could be sent to the provincial level hospitals or eventually to Urumbato, where, where we had uh, a, a couple of hospitals that were uh, uh, sort of Western, uh, Western medicine prevail. Uh, maternity rest homes for women in the last stages of pregnancy were also set up in the countryside and helped undercut uh, infant and child mortality. The Nikos provided pensions for the elderly. And so the uh, small, but enough so that the, uh, they would not be so-called, uh, in quotes, a burden on their children. And uh, I've got to say, uh, when Western advisors came in in the 1990s, they looked at this minimal pension as, a, as something to be uh, gotten rid of. Uh, and uh, I remember meeting the uh, guy who was brought in by AID, the Agency for International Development, in 1998. Uh, he wanted the Mongols to move from a defined benefit uh, where you get uh, it's the state is obligated to provide you, or the collective is obligated to provide you with uh, a sufficient living, a sufficient pension, to a defined contribution. What that means is that the herder would be responsible for his own retirement, for his own pension. And I said, how would that work? Well, he said, um, you know, they could invest in the Mongolian Stock Exchange. <laughs> The Mongolian Stock Exchange at that point worked one day a week. And uh, it, it, I pointed this out to him. This is the typical of these advisors. They were brought in because they were they had a sort of cookie cutter approach without knowing much about a, a pastoral economy, without knowing much about Mongolia. I pointed this out to him. Well, he said, you know, they could invest in the London Stock Exchange or New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> Some guy living 300 miles from Nowheresville is going to be able to uh, invest for his pension in the New York Stock Exchange. That is, that's the level of sophistication about, about this. Anyway, uh, unbelievable. Uh, they also, at that time, under the Negdel system, I, I, don't, I don't mean to uh, portray it as paradise. They were authoritarian, they were really authoritarian structure. Uh, they had libraries. They had newspapers, which provided them with weather information, which was critical uh, for herders at that time. <clears throat> the state established dormitory schools. Uh, as the herders were wandering around, their kids would be educated in, uh, in schools and in dormitories. Um, and the success of this system can be gauged by the extraordinarily high rate of literacy. Uh, the Mongols, of course, claimed 98%. I don't believe that. But certainly, uh, it was high for most pastoral economies. 
Um, the uh, bad side I've already mentioned, uh, Megdos rarely punished the lazy and the incompetent. So you had uh, some people who took advantage of their uh, stability, their, uh, the fact that uh, there would be wages, whatever they did. 1990, the, the socialist system collapsed. And uh, the Mongols had a choice. Uh, they could seek technical advice, investment opportunities from China, or from the Western financial agencies like the IMF, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. China was ruled out because of uh, the fear that they would again be overwhelmed by the Chinese, and there was a Sinophobia because of the uh, fact that from the late 17th century till 1911, when Qing Dynasty collapsed, uh, the Mongols believed that they were exploited, terribly exploited uh, by China, and so they decided to move uh, towards the, the West. James Baker, our Secretary of State at that time, came uh, to Mongolia in August of 1990 and promised to uh, facilitate Mongolia's entrance into the uh, World Bank the Asia, uh, and the Asian Development Bank. He left within six hours, and that's been typical actually, but he left in part because, anybody know? The, Ira the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, uh, so he had to be back in the States. Um, the uh, Mongolia is built up as this uh, great democratic system. Uh, Bush, when he was president, came for six hours. Uh, uh, Secretary Clinton came and spent about six hours praising the, the democratic aspects of Mongolia. Uh, they should only know. Anyway, uh, and from 1990 on, uh, a, uh, they brought in uh, the AID, the World Bank, and they brought in Jeffrey Sachs, who is a colleague of mine in Columbia, and uh, was the architect of so-called shock therapy, uh, moving directly towards privatization uh, in all areas of the economy. And that is one of the factors in displacement. Uh, they did this in a uh, in a pell-mell way, uh, in, in terms of industry, what they did was give coupons to people in uh, <coughs> Mongolia, uh, uh, which uh, provided them with a share of a factory or a mine or whatever else they were involved in. <coughs> These people had no idea what this was about. They had no idea what capitalism was all about. And so some, uh, some people who were aware of that went around and offered them a penny on the dollar. They got uh, these coupons for nothing, and the result was that some people made out like bandits and controlled the industrial economy. In the herder, in the herder enterprises, the collectives were almost immediately disbanded within two years without consideration of the ramifications of that. And, uh, Animals were privatized, but also uh, the uh, things like trucks uh, that were very important in terms of transport uh, of animals from one region to another. All of the infrastructure elements, some people made out like bandits and the, most people did not. Um, the, the, uh, what the what Sachs and others eventually he's changed his mind. Uh, he has moved. He thought he believes that shock therapy was a big mistake. Uh, no, and uh, the austerity aspect of it—that is, government ought, uh, ought to be limited, and uh, um, there ought to be uh, no debts incurred by the government to have a balanced budget, which meant that spending on education 
health, social welfare was decreased dramatically. Uh, and every year from 1992 to 2005, there was a 1% drop in literacy as a result of that. Since then, it's been a, a little bit of an effort to stop that, but a 13% drop in literacy in 13 years. Uh, in addition, the, her, the international financial agencies did not understand that cooperation was essential in the Mongolian countryside. You just can't make it on your own uh, without cooperation. And one, one aspect of this, of course, if you're not, if you're working as a family rather than in a collective, you're going to uh, basically, I just have five minutes, so I'm not going to spend much time on this, but let me point out what happened was you needed help. So what you did was you took your son out of school and uh, have had him help in bringing the animals together. The privatization process was riddled with corruption uh, and uh, the wealthy got more and more of this and the corruption has spread so that uh, just over the past decade, the president of Mongolia uh, was found guilty of corruption, was given time in jail. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> prime minister who in 2009 gave away resources, Mongolia's gold and copper resources to a, an Australian British company, uh, is now being investigated for rip-offs during that time for bribery. Uh, November of this year, there was a AID provided small uh, money that was provided for loans for small and medium um, uh, enterprises. Tremendous bribery. The Secretary of Agriculture is now being investigated. Uh, and was forced to leave. The, the Speaker of Parliament is in jail. And uh, this uh, disaster could have been avoided if you had moved slowly towards capitalism, towards, and so that people understood what was going on, so these herders would know what was going on. Um, the loss of the, the, the impact of austerity on the state, the government did not maintain wells. Uh, herders had to pay veterinarians for their services instead of that being provided uh, by the state and there have been all sorts of diseases that have spread among the animals. Um, state loans were unavailable. Um, the herders are smart in terms of money, and uh, they moved from having a definite number of goats as opposed to sheep. Uh, in the old days, through the Megdell period, there were four sheep to every goat because the goats are devastating to the grass pasture line. They consume all the way down to, to the uh, root of the plant. It's now one to one. And the result is that a lot of areas are uh, being desertified, desertified uh, in, in the country. Uh, why, why are there now 60 million animals? Because they're not well maintained. And the result is that even Russia has imposed limits on restrictions on the, the sale, uh, on the buying of animals from Mongolia. Uh, and uh, the result is that there's a trouble. You don't want 60 million animals. You want to sell them. And you want to sell the meat and you want to sell uh, whatever else is, is important. Um, one solution which this president chose, the president who's was uh, found guilty, was setting up a building a road east-west, which doesn't exist in, in Mongolia. The major transport nexus is north-south. Railroads, roads, everything else, uh, minimal roads. Was to build a road east-west and have the herders uh, live along that, uh, that nexus. Most important thing is migration, to preserve uh, the, the pasture land. And the people who've done the most work on this, people at Cambridge uh, University, where they have, uh, I, I don't know how many anthropologists 
I don't know how Cambridge justifies this, but they have five people teaching Mongolian anthropology. Um, how this happened, I don't know, it's great, uh, from my standpoint, but uh, they have actually gone into these areas and, and noticed what happens when there are roads built in this a tremendous desertification. What the result of all of this is the herders can't make it and they move into the capital city. <coughs> 1.5 million of the 3 million people in Mongolia live in the capital. An absolutely uh, ridiculous and impossible situation where they live in their quarters surrounding the, the city uh, with no running water, uh, no electricity. In winter, they uh, use coal to, uh, for heat purposes. The result is that Ulaanbaatar, the capital city, is uh, one of the most, probably the most polluted city in, in the world uh, in, in winter, uh, leading to asthma problems, health problems, respiratory problems. This displacement was needless. And uh, uh, I know I don't have any more time, so I'll stop. There's a lot more to the story. Okay, thank you. So it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, REEI's invited guest for this wonderful event, Dr. Greta Ewing. Um, Dr. Ewing received her PhD in anthropology from the uh, University of Michigan where she now is a lecturer too in the program in Comparative and International Studies. She's also a faculty associate at CREES, the Center for Russian and East European Studies at Michigan. The courses that Dr. Euling teaches at the University of Michigan include the politics of memory, hidden histories, human smuggling and trafficking in comparative perspective, humanitarian dilemmas, gender, war, and peace, and Introduction to International Studies. Greta Euling's research interests are concerned with the relationship between national security and migrant rights. Her publications explore the politics of migration and citizenship, indigeneity and sovereignty, and the challenges associated with xenophobia and the social integration of migrants in both Ukraine and the United States. Euling has carried out research on asylum seekers and migrants to Europe, as well as the United States government response to human smuggling and trafficking. She's particularly interested in the politics of compassion toward unaccompanied and undocumented migrant children. Her book, um, Beyond Memory, The Deportation and Repatriation of the Crimean Tatars is very well known uh, in the field, very influential book and it's based on ethnographic fieldwork in former Soviet eras, areas. Um, in 2015, Dr. Euling accepted a Fulbright Scholar Grant to carry out research in Ukraine. Her project examines the experiences of people displaced by the war in the Donbass and the Russian occupation of Crimea, focusing on their political agency, tolerance, and human rights. And it is this research uh, that we are going to hear about today in Dr. Euling's talk, which is titled PTSD Land, the Emotional Geography of Ukraine's Displaced. Okay. Thanks so much. 